Welcome to Tanak Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with episode number 57 of a Rabbi Cross Examines the New Testament with Rabbi Michael Skovac. Tonight, Acts chapter 24. Rabbi, welcome back to the show. Good to see you again. Always nice to have you here, but not here, unfortunately. <laughs> So, whoop, there we go. reality. Yes, this is definitely our VR uh, room with the virtual rabbi for now. That's funny. My my daughter came to me today and she said uh, she heard this funny thing uh, on something called the Rapping Rabbis or something like that. And <laughs> and they had this they had this uh, this funny rap song about the can't eat pork, don't let it touch your fork, blah blah blah. <laughs> oh man, that's funny. I'd rather have you the virtual rabbi than the rapping rabbi, I think, any day. That's okay. <laughs> Sounds pretty interesting, though, can, that's for you sure. You can have both. There we go. There we go. Cool. All right, so uh, we're uh, we're making our way uh, across the Atlantic Axe, and, uh, man, it's, it's, we've tread a lot of water, so that's good. I think we're going to be— We have. Uh, it's going to be uh, an interesting uh, show for tonight, and as you just so delightfully teased me, uh, we're close to Acts. I mean, to Romans. That's going to be uh, another fun book to go through for sure. Letter. So, you know what? <laughs> uh-huh. looking, looking forward to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm getting tired of Paul being locked up in jail and, <laughs> and, and having having to, to to get out of another close call. And he this is, he seems to be, you know, going from. Uh, one catastrophe to one catastrophe to another, and uh, he's, he's just been in a heap of trouble for the past few chapters, and he just can't seem to get out of it. It's kind of like out of the uh, fire and into the frying pan, sort of a scenario, yeah. right? <laughs> and it it seems to be really characteristic of his entire career that uh, he's just constantly having these um, crises and battles and. Not getting, he's not not getting along with a lot of people. Um, so what what happens here is that you know in the at the end of the last chapter he was rescued again um, from being lynched you know for the tenth time, and uh, they're now going to have actually somewhat of a formal trial in front of Felix, um, who is uh, I guess the Roman uh, fellow in charge. Uh, and uh, the governor, really. And so they bring down the people that have a, a, a gripe with Paul. They bring down the dream team for this trial. They have the high priest, Ananias, and they bring some elders. And then they get a high-powered attorney, <laughs> Tertullus. Um, and, you know, they're going to actually try and press their case now against Paul. So they begin in verse is it two here, in the middle of verse 2. Um, it must have been, I imagine, a formality that when you appeared before the judge or the governor, you would flatter them. And so uh, Tertullus begins by saying, Your Excellency, Your Excellency, because of you we have long enjoyed peace and reforms have been made for this people because of your foresight. They're really buttering him up. Right. And we welcome this in every way and everywhere with utmost gratitude. So they're basically emphasizing the fact that what they really appreciate about the uh, government of, of Felix is that they've had peace and it's been stable and he's done many things to make sure that the you know the country's been stable and they want to express their gratitude now we have to remember again that this kind of cozy relationship with the Roman governing bodies was really typical of the relationship that the Romans would have had with the high priesthood because the high priesthood was essentially uh, an office, you know, high office that was purchased from the Romans. And the other group that would have been cozy and tight with the Romans would have been the Sadducees at Stukim because, you know, they were the aristocracy. If you wanted to find a, a, the more wealthy aristocracy at the time, it would have been the Sadducees. And that's exactly why they're invested in maintaining the social order. They don't want to see uh, rebellions and riots and you know the the stability challenge. They want to have you know law and order. They're the law and order candidates, and they want peace <laughs> and they want stability. And they don't like you know uh, you know 
people that are you know throwing around these ideas of uh, redemption and Messiah and a better time and a, you know the kingdom of God these are kind of concepts which are very very troublesome to the Sadducees and so they complement and, and so really what I'm trying to say is that the Pharisees and, and who are normally the elders for some reason the writer here tries to drag in elders to give the impression that it's a united front against Paul but the, the Pharisees and the elders, you know, these are the exact people that did not accept Roman rule. These are the people that were praying for a overturning of the status quo. These are the people that were were were, were praying intensely for the Messiah to come and for the Romans to be booted out. And so it's really it's not so strange that the ringleader here is the high priest because that would have been the group of the Jewish people would have been the priesthood and the Sadducees who would have been really most cozy with the Romans and come here to present this case. So they say, um, in verse four, we don't want to detain you any further. We know we we don't want to waste your time. Uh, I beg you to hear us briefly with your customary graciousness. They're really being flattering here. So they say, we have in fact found this man, Paul, a, now I don't know how, uh, I'm sure this is translated very, very differently in different translations. I have here the New Revised Standard Version, which uh, says we found this man to be a pestilent fellow. Um, from, I guess from the word pest, he's a pesty fellow. Um, many translations have uh, plague. You know, because we, you often speak about insects as a plague. And that there are pests as well, pest control. That's often the, the euphemism they use for insects or pests. The uh, um, complete Jewish Bible uh, calls it. Um, where is it? Verse five. He's an he's an agitator. Yeah, definitely a pest. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. but before the agitation is what. When oh, what verse was that? In? in verse four. Um, I'm sorry. Oh. In verse uh, five, we found this man to be. Um, yeah, a pest. Really, uh, <laughs> a, a pest. Yeah, that's what it says. Uh, but I is. think that's pest funny. doesn't really capture. Um, I, I think really he's uh, he's a serious annoyance gotcha. is the word I think they want to use. And they go on to explain he's an agitator. And that really is more clear. An agitator among all the Jews throughout the world. Now, we mentioned many times in Matthew that the writers of the, of the Greek scriptures have a penchant for uh, – you know, uh, exaggerating and for, you know, going way overboard. Um, you know, obviously Paul was not riling up the Jews throughout the world, all the Jews throughout the world. This is a, you know, clearly an exaggeration, but they're accusing him of being an agitator. Now, I, I'm thinking all the commentaries that I, that I consulted with, agitator is seen here really as a someone disturbing the peace someone that is really riling up people against the Roman rule, uh, an agitator really, meaning the someone that's guilty of sedition, of, of fomenting rebellion. And so the, the, the attorney here, this Tertullus, is saying to Felix, look, this guy Paul, you know, is just a bad apple. He's trying to cause trouble all over the world, and he's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Now, that's... Uh, obviously, you know, uh, referring to the Jesus movement. You know, Jesus was uh, allegedly from Nazareth, and he was called the Nazarene, Jesus of Nazareth, for that reason. And so his followers are, are often called Nazarenes for that reason. There are other theories as to why um, followers of Jesus might be called uh, Nazarenes. I've seen, I've seen a whole bunch of theories, but for the time being, let's leave it at that, that um, this is referring to those who follow Jesus of Nazareth, so they're accusing him of that, and he even tried to profane the temple. We saw back in uh, Acts 21 that they actually accused him of doing it, not trying to do it. They said he's he's even brought uh, you know pagans or Gentiles into the temple. So here they they just sort of water that down to he tried. Well, maybe it's not watering that. Maybe it's saying the same thing. And so we seized him. They, they did more than this, arrest him. They actually were about to kill him. They were about to lynch him. They sort of tone it down here. They didn't simply arrest him. 
and then they say, look, you'll examine him yourself. You'll be able to see what the truth is. And then in verse 9, um, this is sort of like just to get a nice kick in, like a, a gratuitous kick in at the Jews. <laughs> um, verse 9 speaks about the Jews also joined in the charge by asserting that all this was true. Um, again, you know, th this language is very loaded and it's very inflammatory. And we've saw throughout the you know, book of Acts so far that, that this comes up frequently. Of course, in the Gospel of John, this is the, the term that's used, the Jews. And again, I, I can imagine that after someone's been raised on the, the, the Christian scriptures and just constantly hearing about the Jews uh, in, and not in a positive light, um, it's not, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out why uh, you know, Jews have, have really suffered so much over the course of the last 2,000 years. But I wanted to just comment on some of the charges here. First of all, what's um, interesting is that the charge, the, the, the major charge against Paul is his being a troublemaker and an agitator. That's really the, the charge that's going to get the attention of the Romans the most. You know, uh, anything that's, let's say, religious about Paul, you know, if they said, you know, we saw he doesn't eat kosher food, uh, the Romans don't really care. Um, you know, the, the Romans are concerned, and we know this about them, uh, about the stability of the kingdom, about peace, and about, um, you know, the, 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 the social order being maintained. And so that's really the problem, and that seems to be the thrust of what uh, Tertullus presents here against Paul, that he's a troublemaker, he's an agitator, he's stirring up people all over the world. And it's not, they're not, he's not really accusing Paul here of heresy. It's, I, don't, I don't think the Romans really care much about whether Paul is such a religious Jew. And interestingly, when you go back to Acts 21, uh, when we saw the charges against Paul, both from his fellow, um, let's say, Jesus group and from the other Jewish people, they were totally religious charges. So, um, you know, James brings forth the charge um, from fellow believers in Jesus that somehow they, you know, have understood that Paul is not teaching people to keep the Torah and to, and to circumcise their children. And uh, he's you know, someone who's uh, really not in line with the teachings of Jesus. And that's coming from his fellow believers in Jesus. And those are purely religious accusations. And then a little bit later in the chapter, the Jews from Asia come, and basically the same thing, that he's teaching, you know, the, against the Torah, against the temple, against the people. They're not accusing him of being someone in Acts 21 who's unhappy with the Roman rule. They're basically purely religious charges. Um, but here, you know, the Romans don't care about that. The Romans don't really care. So the presentation against Paul is primarily political. What bothered me here is this. You know, did the Romans really need Jewish people to come to them to press charges of rebellion, of sedition, of treason, you know, were the Romans sitting around and just playing cards and hmm. not not being aware of what was going on in their own kingdom? You know, we know that the Romans basically had set up a police state, and the Romans ruled with an iron fist, and they were very, very watchful. They're extremely watchful of any signs of rebellion, of sedition, of treason, of people who were stirring up any kind of movement that would challenge them and oppose them they didn't need you know the, the the elders to come to them and say "Ooh, do you know there's a guy that's making trouble the romans would know it before anyone else would and so it, it is strange that you have to have you know these people who are, are not part of the government and not part of the police state come in and let the romans know and it's also something that happened back with the crucifixion of jesus it's so bizarre that they, they would have needed, um, you know, uh, a, a Jew, Judas Iscariot, to come and let them know uh, about the whereabouts of Jesus. The Romans already 
had their eyes open for any kind of rebellion, especially around Passover time. And throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus is hiding and he's telling people, don't spread the word that I'm the Messiah, don't spread the word that I did miracles. Jesus knew that the Romans were very watchful, and if they had any sense that someone was gathering crowds and performing miracles and claiming to be the Messiah, he would have been snuffed out in two minutes. And so when he comes marching into Jerusalem with a bunch of followers with swords saying that he's the son of David, the Romans would have arrested him immediately on the spot. He wouldn't have gotten two feet into Jerusalem. And so the whole story is so bizarre in the Gospels about needing a Jew with the name Judas to betray Jesus. It really it rings hollow if we understand what was really going on back then. And so here, too, as well, the Romans wouldn't have needed these Jews marching in and explaining that there's a problem on their hands. Um, so what happens is Paul, again, you know, for the fifth time already, I think, has to defend himself. And he, he gives a very, very strange defense. Um, he, he says, I cheerfully, I don't know what, what your translation is, but in verse 10, I have Paul replying that I cheerfully make my defense. I happily, I'm very happy to defend myself, Paul says, <laughs> knowing that for many years you've been a judge over this nation. And as you can find out, Paul says, it's not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem and they did not find me disputing with anyone in the temple or stirring up a crowd, either in the synagogues or throughout the city. So again, what Paul addresses here is the charge of him disturbing the peace. And, you know, it's true that Paul is trying to say that he didn't start any riots. He didn't intend to, to, to disrupt the social order, but we know that, that there were disturbances because of his presence. There were certainly, as we saw in Acts 21, people were, were horrified at seeing him. They said, who is this? this? This person has the nerve to come into Jerusalem when we know he's been teaching things that are, are totally against the Torah. Now, they didn't come to the Romans with that charge. They were complaining to the leaders of the Jesus movement, and they were complaining about Paul's inappropriate religious behavior. But it did stir up a riot. It, and Paul, him, no, Paul himself knows. So to claim here that I came to Jerusalem for 12 days and nothing happened, it's really being a bit disingenuous because Paul himself knows that he didn't intend to start a riot, but his presence started a, a tremendous riot. And... Um, he goes on to say, after denying that he caused any trouble, and he says, neither can they prove to you the charge they now bring against me. Now, it's not clear exactly what this charge is because there were several charges that were just leveled against him. And so maybe what he means here is that they can't prove any of the charges that they're making against me. Um, I don't think he's referring to one particular charge. And then he launches into something, again, which seems to be tendentious. He says, but I admit to you that according to the way, the way the, the, the Jesus movement was referred to as the way sometimes. Uh, and he says, according to the way which they call a sect, um, I worship the God of our ancestors, believing everything laid down according to the law or written in the prophets. So the first problem here is, you know, if I was a Roman, I would say, who cares I'm like, why do the Romans care if Paul is a good religious Jewish boy, that he's always believed properly and he's always followed the religion properly? You know, they don't care about that. They are concerned about the charges of sedition, of fomenting rebellion, of troublemaking. They don't really care um, how from, how religious Paul is. Um, and it's interesting, by the way, that what he says is – um, often the defense that's made by today's Hebrew Christians and Messianic Jews and even many Christians, what they insist is that they're doing nothing wrong because everything that they believe is perfectly in line with the uh, belief of the, uh, of the ancestors of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they, they, they assert, they, they insist that they are – they believe in the, 
the God, the, the historical Jewish God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, I'm almost positive that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not entertain the idea of a trinity or believe that Jesus was God. Um, but that's what they insist. They insist that they believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that they do nothing that's against the, what's written in the Bible. Anything that's written in the Torah or the prophets <laughs> Um, and that's again the the what we hear from today's Christians, both Gentile Christians and especially Messianic Jews and yeah, Messianics for sure. They definitely cling to that, um, saying that's that's further proof that Paul will at least at least claim to keep Torah, to not violate Torah and all things. Which would more if if that statement was had so much groundbreaking like anchorage to it, then more Christians would be Messianics. So you would think, yeah, you would think, you think. <laughs> uh, possibly. Um, and it's interesting because we, we see in the church world today, um, certainly more of an interest in practices from the Hebrew scriptures than there would have been a hundred years ago. You know, it's not unusual today to see Christians, not Messianic Jews, but Gentile Christians wearing a Jewish uh, prayer shawl, a talit or blowing a shofar in their churches. Um, so it, it's interesting that the idea of following the, the law and, uh, you know, as expressed in the Torah and the prophets, it, it was never embraced by the church, right. ever. They, they were allergic to it. <laughs> but it. It sounds like, it looks like now, there is at least the beginning of a stirring in that direction. Um, I... I <laughs> I don't want to get into this. It's a different topic, but I, I have plenty of stories. Nice. So um, he goes on to say in verse 15, you know, again, in defending himself, that he, I have hope in God. And again, this is what's so peculiar about Paul's defense. He's just on the wrong topic. Hmm. He's sort of he's answering the wrong questions here. The Romans are not interested in what he believes. They're not interested in, um, you know, his theology. And th he's just missing the, the point of the whole discussion. And he goes on to say, not only does he have a hope in God, he goes on to say a hope that they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, what, what's strange is that the ringleader of this prosecution against him was the high priest who was the Sadducee and we know that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead so the fact that he says here that they themselves accept this belief in the resurrection of the dead is a bit strange it's, it's it doesn't really apply when we come to the Sadducees now whether or not there's a belief that the, the righteous and the unrighteous will be resurrected is not 100% clear it does seem uh, when you read, at least on the surface, Daniel chapter 12, that the, both the righteous and the unrighteous will rise at the end of days. It's just that the, the righteous will have a good time and the, the, the wicked will not have a good time. Um, it's not a thousand percent clear that that was the belief of at least, let's say, the Pharisees at that time. And today, also, if you research the topic of the resurrection, it's not clear that everyone will be resurrected in the end times. It, it might be that the wicked will not um, experience that. But I, I, I don't know for sure. But at least Paul here is in, in asserting that they all believe. And he's including in here, obviously, the high priests and the Sadducees, um, this, this promise. Now, again, who cares? From the Romans' point of view, they're not really interested if he believes in the resurrection. And he says in verse 17, I'm sorry, in verse 16, Therefore I do my best always to have a clear conscience toward God and all people. Again, irrelevant. The Romans don't really care. Now, after some years, I came to bring alms to my nation. He's telling a story now. So he was obviously away from the land of Israel. He says, and after a number of years, I came to bring alms to my nation. So he was collecting uh, charity funds for the poor of Israel, especially poor of Jerusalem, and to offer sacrifices. It's not clear to me that Paul really came to Jerusalem initially intending to offer sacrifices. We know that he was pressed into doing it. We know that when 
in Acts 21, they wanted him to demonstrate that he is pro-Torah. They had him sponsor the sacrifices of the, the four, I think it's four people that were um, Naz, Nazarites, Nazirim, and to participate to some degree in their temple service and to purify himself. Um, so they made him do that, but it's not clear to me that when he originally came to, to Jerusalem is for that purpose. Um, and then he says that while he was doing this, this is part of the story, they found me in the temple. These are the people that were complaining against Paul. He was completing the rite of purification without any crowd of disturbance. Paul is saying that there was no problem until these you know, uh, troublemakers for the Jews from Asia came and they're the ones, Paul says, that should have been here making the accusation, which is true, really. I mean, if the whole riot started because these Jews from Asia had some complaint against Paul, he's got a good point here. You know, they should be the ones that are here complaining against me. Uh, and then he says, or let these men here tell what crime they have found when I stood before the council. So again, when he stood before the Jewish religious council, the concern they had was his were religious in nature, were spiritual in nature, but now again it's shifting. We're not interested in the spiritual issues that they have with Paul. They're interested here for some reason. Um, well, we know again, I describe why the Sadducees would be interested in prosecuting Paul because he's someone who's disturbing the peace. Right. Um, now, one of the problems is this. If Paul is disturbing the peace, um, because he's part of the Jesus movement. So the question is, why aren't all the other Jesus followers being dragged into court like this? Right, meaning right. That, meaning that if the problem with Paul is that he is a believer in Jesus, and he believes that Jesus is the Messiah, and he believes Jesus is the King, and he only pledges his loyalty to Jesus as the true King of Israel— and, and he believes that Jesus is going to come back any minute to reign in Jerusalem and to literally throw out the Romans. Um, that's something that would get all the Jesus followers in trouble. So the question is, you know, if Paul is really the same, if, if Paul's beliefs are the same as Peter and James and John and all the other apostles and disciples and followers in Jerusalem— why is Paul the only one being dragged into court here and prosecuted? They should be dragging all of the Jerusalem believers into court. And if Paul is not the same as those other people, the um, question is, how is he different? Um, I've been arguing that Paul is different religiously, spiritually, because the people in Jerusalem, I believe, are uh, very serious about observing the Torah. I don't believe Paul was, and I believe that's exactly why he was being accused. Um, but it's not clear here um, why, you know, this has become a question of his religious beliefs. Uh, it's totally off topic. Uh, the whole idea of the resurrection is totally irrelevant, and it's not clear, you know, at all why Paul is defending himself like this. These are not really the charges against him. And then he says, in, in finishing this story, he says, uh, you know, I don't know why these people that have dragged me into the court here have any problem with me, unless, he says in verse 21, it was this one sentence that I called out while standing before them that it's about the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial before you today. Now, again, that's disingenuous. Is Paul really being dragged before the Romans because he believes in the resurrection. Now, the only way you, you can understand this is that what it means is that he believes that uh, there'll be not just uh, the resurrection that happened with Jesus, but that Jesus will be brought back to life again, what Christians refer as the second coming. Um, that might get Paul into trouble, because if he's advocating this idea that there's going to be someone coming soon you know, from the dead, but he's going to be the king and the ruler, that might disturb the Romans. But the, the idea that he believed in the past that Jesus was resurrected and then went up to heaven, uh, you know, later on, that wouldn't disturb the Romans. And it's not why he would be called in front of the Roman court here, in front of Felix. 
um, if it's the, just the idea, which he seems to be implying here, you know, he, he's not saying about the resurrection of one dead person. He's saying it's the resurrection of the dead. I mean, the principle that I believe that the dead will come back to life. Right. Again, that was only stirring up some controversy between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. But this is not a trial between the high priest and, the you know, Tertullus and all the people there against all the Pharisees. It's against Paul in particular. So it's not really clear what he means here and, and what this would mean at all to say that, ah, this must be the real reason I'm in trouble. It's all about the resurrection of the dead that I'm trial before you today. Um, really a, a sort of peculiar thing for him to call out. So we're told in verse 22 that Felix, who was informed about the way, he knew quite a bit about this movement. It's not clear if he knew only about the Jerusalem group or he also knew about Paul's group. Um, did he know that they may not be exactly on the same page or did he think for whatever reasons that they were all on the same page? Um, he adjourns. He doesn't want to finish the trial at this point. And uh, he says, look, well, when Lysias, the tribune, comes down, then we'll decide your case to Paul. Um, it's interesting that I, I mentioned a few moments ago that, you know, if the problem here is what Paul believes, then really it's not only he that should be dragged into court, it should be all of the followers of Jesus, especially when we remember that Paul was a Roman citizen. Um, that, that was something that was his ace in the hole that, that saved him that, from trouble in the past. So, you know, if there's a problem with people who believe in the resurrection, well, that would be the case with Peter and James and John and all the, the people that were in Jerusalem, part of the Jesus movement, and they weren't Roman citizens, as far as I understand. And so why weren't they the ones dragged into court way before Paul? Yeah, that's a good point. So the, the whole story is, is a little bit peculiar. Um, so finally what happens here is that Felix comes with his wife, Drusilla, who apparently was the daughter of Herod Agrippa I. And she was a Jew. Um, and it might be one of the reasons why he knew a little bit about this Jewish sect called the Way. Um, and, and it's a very peculiar little story that happens now. Um, so when Felix's wife comes, he sends for Paul. And apparently he hears Paul giving his testimony religiously. Paul gives him a whole... Uh, talk about his faith in Jesus being the Messiah, Paul's beliefs about justice, about self-control, about the coming judgment. I mean, he, he basically gives a, a whole sermon, a whole church sermon to Felix. And it's not really clear, you know, was Felix asking for this kind of discussion? Did Paul just get bold and, and launch into his witnessing here? It's not, it's a very strange interaction. It's not clear why uh, why Paul launched into this uh, was Felix asking for it and then we're told that um, Felix became upset and frightened by what Paul was saying it, it seems to give the impression maybe he had a guilty conscience um, the, the commentaries point out that his marriage to Drusilla may not have been a legal one it may have been a case of adultery I'm sure he wasn't the most righteous person in the world. And as a matter of fact, we know from Roman sources that he was so brutal in his prosecution of the Jews that the Romans relieved him of his duty. They didn't let him stay as the governor there. So he was definitely a flawed character. And um, you know, some, some of the commentaries insist that it was Paul's bold testimony that got him to be self-conscious and... Uh, maybe feeling guilty. So he says to, to Paul, look, uh, we're going to we'll end our discussion. Um, and he says, look, you're going to go away for the present. When I have an opportunity, I'll send for you. So he, he seems to want to meet with Paul, and then he sends him away again. Um, and the, it says here in verse 26, at the same time, though, Felix hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. So I guess this seems to suggest that the whole reason... Maybe he wanted to meet with Paul in verse 24 was to 
get Paul to possibly offer a bribe, um, maybe in the sense that, look, I'm locked up in prison here and I'm a Roman citizen and the Jews, you know, want to prosecute me. Maybe you can pull some strings and, you know, ship me out and get me saved and mm, right. get, get me out of here. So it's not clear what really is going on here, but apparently it's revealing that Felix's motivations were to somehow secure some kind of bribe from Paul. And then we're told that after two years had passed, Felix was finally succeeded by another governor. I'm not going to even try to pronounce his name, Porcius Festus. <laughs> when, I, when I was a, when I was about, uh, I think nine or ten years old, that was one of my nicknames, Festus. Don't ask me why. <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a character on Gunsmoke uh, that is actually named Festus. That's funny. I remember that when I was a kid. You cannot be old enough to have watched Gunsmoke. <laughs> Man, I used to love Gunsmoke. <laughs> that, was a, that was a TV show when I was a kid. Oh. <laughs> uh, are we closer in age than I thought? <laughs> Maybe. I don't think so. Maybe you're watching reruns. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. I definitely wasn't live, I'm pretty sure. So. <laughs> uh, so that's funny. <clears throat> what's strange here is that it seems that Paul's in prison for two years. Um, you know, he's languishing in prison until this new new sheriff comes to town. And uh, he wanted to grant the Jews a favor, so he let Paul stay in prison. Um, it's, again, it's it's a way of getting another kick in at the Jews because it's not just some Jews or the Jews that had a gripe with Paul. It's the Jews giving the impression that it's every single last right. for boy in Jerusalem <laughs> um, was was hoping that Paul's going to be left in prison. Um, so. It is interesting that, um, you know, the, 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 what ha should have happened here is either the the Romans should have quickly found Paul guilty. I think that uh, if he really was guilty and even suspected of being guilty of treason, of, of uh, sedition, of challenging Roman rule, the Romans would have found him guilty in three seconds. Mm -hmm. And so he really should have either been found guilty immediately or just released immediately. There would be no reason for the Romans to keep him in jail endlessly, delaying judgment. Um, you know, the Romans weren't afraid of the Jews. And they they did that in the story of the crucifixion, that Pontius Pilate wanted to let Jesus go. But they, they say that he was just afraid of the Jewish mob who was clamoring for the crucifixion of Jesus. I mean, the idea that Pontius Pilate was intimidated by the Jews is just absurd. And so the same thing seems to be going on here, that the Romans need to grant the Jews a favor. And so that's why they left Paul in prison. Um, the Romans didn't need to do anything for the Jews. The Jews were so incredibly subordinate to the Romans, um, beholden to them for their very breath, um, it, it, it just seems to be a strange retelling of what probably happened back then. Um, but that's um, where we're going to leave off for tonight, and we'll continue the, the saga of Paul in prison uh, next week of Acts chapter 25. Yeah, that's funny. That's going to be a good one. Uh, <laughs> Michael Vergloth on uh, the YouTube chat, he said, it seems like Paul really enjoyed hearing the sound of his own voice. <laughs> Could very well be. <laughs> well, Rabbi, it's been fun once again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you same time, same place next week. Hashem willing. Rabbi, have a great week. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov, everybody. We love you guys. Y'all take care. All the best. <laughs> Shaifa 